All right, everybody, welcome to our meetup. This is uh, going to be our first sub presentation, and we're going to be talking about PEP 8. And uh, here to present to us is uh, McKay on PEP 8. Emily, do you actually want to just go through okay, I will take those and all just stand up? All right. So, I volunteer for Pet Bay because it's something that I get hit for on uh, Stack Overflow all the time. Because people on there can be pretty mean. And so they'll you know, be like, oh, you put too many spaces here. And man, what are you doing with this? And your camel case, this, and that, and the other. And so I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll learn this Pet Bay stuff. And so um, going through it, a lot of it is fairly tedious and it seems really nitpicky. And picky. Like, you can tell that a lot of it is just the personal preference of the creator, Guido Van Rossum. But then, um, right near the end, the, my favorite section, which I actually didn't include a lot of in my presentation, is uh, just kind of suggestions for the language. Like, for example, not to use lambda functions. He hates lambda functions, and he's all about this comprehension. So, anyway, starting from the top. So, um, it was written by three people, and I only knew the first one. Um, maybe someone a little bit more experienced. Dave, do you do you know who Barry Warsaw and nope. Nick Cohen are? So, anyway, they helped with the PEP 8 creation. Um, and kind of the whole mantra behind why we have this is because code is read more often than it's written. Readability counts. Sorry, I 100% Kirk. agree with that. Um, what we started out writing here at Ardano is in Perl. And in Perl you, can, you don't have to format anything a certain way, and so you get some real nightmare code. Um, and so I've really appreciated, appreciated that in Python um, simply because you, know, you, you look through a project and for the most part you know the indentation helps you know where, when you're in and out of a loop. Um, and so this kind of takes it a step further. Um, the, this is by no means an exhaustive list, and it's kind of with the addendum that it will be changing as the language changes and as it updates. So, and then finally, um, you know, this is a guideline. It's not a hard and fast rule, and so if your specific organization has a certain style or way they like doing things, or if you're working on maybe an open source project or somebody else's code, um, consistency with what's already there is more important than following these guidelines. Okay, so next one. All right, so first off is um, indentation rules. And the PEP8 document is full of <laughs> examples like this. Um, but essentially, uh, some of the big uh, rules are, because later we'll find out that you don't want more than 79 characters in a line. That improves readability. And they also wanted it so you could have your code next or side by side with uh, another piece of code. And so that's why they did the shorter lengths. And so you'll find yourself doing a lot of this, where you're splitting in the middle of a uh, you know, uh, list of parameters or, or anything else. And so um, some of the main things, you want to line these up to improve readability. If you have a function and then you have um, the action of the function, you want to just make sure this is offset or just is uh, discernible from the actual action that's being taken. Um, and then hanging indents should add a level. I'm not 100% sure what that means, Dave. Um. It's exactly what you just talked about on the previous block, except uh, on that bottom one you're talking about a function, and on the top one you're talking about arguments to the parameter. Gotcha. And so over here, um, you and can and and really also there on that bottom on that bottom left one, um, if you were to type another line of code, you would not want that to line up with var one and var three, and so you would actually space in the var one and var three an extra four spaces so that the arguments to that long function name are distinguishable by the lines of code that follow it. Like this? Yes. And then you can see over there, they're just showing the examples of what not to do. It's really hard to distinguish uh, what is a parameter and what is um, the actual action being taken. And then kind of the optional thing is um, if you're on your hanging indents, it doesn't have to be a full four spaces or a full tab stop. Um, you can kind of use that as your discretion. Next one. Um. So, a few other indentation rules. Um, let's see here. I think this was just on your if statements. If it has a really long if condition, that you just wanted to match it up to the first um, line right there. And then when you get over here into like your braces and brackets, you've got some variability. He said either line up your uh, closing brace with your first um, row right there. Or if you're not going to do that, then line it up with that letter right there. So you can do that in either of those cases. Um, spaces are the preferred indentation method. And 
this is a little confusing to me because in my IDE, um, well, just in Notepad++, I'll show everything as a tab style, but I think it's treating it as four spaces. Um, you just want consistency. Um, they prefer spaces in all cases unless the project you're working on also already has tabs. Um, Python 3 does not allow any kind of mixing. It will just straight up tank your code. Um, if you're running a Pyth Python 2 project, um, if you run it off the command line with dash T, it will give you a warning and say that not all of the uh, uh, you know, spacing is um, matching up, and then if you want it to actually raise an error, then you can do the dash tt. So max line length, this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, all lines should be at most 79 characters, and then if it's a doc string or a comment line, you want to cap it at 72. This is for readability, and so you have all sorts of stuff like this where you're, you know, kind of cutting it off, and um, in doing this, you want to try and use Python's implied ability to, to cut things off. Um, so, you know, inside of parentheses, um, for example, when you have variables, if you have a bunch of variables, you can just list them one right below each other. That's a really natural way to um, kind of make your code more readable um, or try and do it, you know, with long strings like you see in the example there. Go ahead, Louis. Um, so if you absolutely have to, they give an example here, if you have a really long like, with statement, you can use the backslash character to um, imply a uh, line continuation. And so when you need to do that, you just use that syntax right there. So blank lines um, are more style thing, make it easy to read. Around any top level functions, you want two spaces. And then method definitions inside of your classes, you want a single space around all of them. And then, other than that, it's just up to your discretion. Um, if you want to, you know, lump all your variables together, lump common code, um, you can do that with, you know, just really tasteful use of, of uh, spacing and blank lines. And then imports. Um, he has a whole bunch on these, so they're always at the top of the file. You do not want to do all your imports on the same line, so like he does there, you don't want that. Um, but if you do have multiple things from the same module, then you can do those on the same line. And then there's a hierarchy um, where you standard library imports, related third-party imports, and then finally uh, any local application or specific uh, library-specific imports, those will go third. String quotes, this is one that I always get nailed on because I'm always, you know, putting some things in double quotes and single quotes, but you want to just pick one and stick to it. And then if you have a string and inside you need to uh, imply another set of quotes, um, then he says use the other one. It just improves readability. So, for example, if you have a string and you're using single quotes and then you actually have to make the quote marks inside, use the double quotes to improve readability and let them know exactly what you're doing. And then a triple quoted string should always use the double quotes. Um, a lot of times you'll see these for the uh, you know, doc strings or the, the application headers. And then white space, this is where it kind of gets into his personal preference, but just don't be stupid with your white space and don't do you know ridiculous stuff like, you know, that where you're, it just doesn't have a whole lot of logic to it. Um, you know, make it consistent and don't put white space in places that you don't really need it. I see this in a lot of other languages and I don't know if that's common where you um, will put kind of like the extra like buffer of space. He just said don't do it. So, And then finally, comments. Um, kind of going along with the whole readability thing. As programmers, it's really easy to just kind of, you know, brain vomit onto the page, uh, but he says, you know, try and make it readable, uh, assume other people are going to be reading your code, try and understand what it is you're doing, use complete sentences, capitalize, you know, use punctuation grammar, and if you happen to be a non-native English speaker, maybe run it through somebody who is first for your code. Um, and then finally, doc strings, and this is something I've started doing in all my code. You write a doc string for all public modules, functions, class, classes, and methods. Um, you know, just make it easy for somebody following along to be like, oh, okay, this module's doing this. Use the uh, inline comments, which is, you know, the, the pound sign next to a line of code. Um, use those really sparingly because they can be confusing. Go ahead, Robert. Does everybody know what a doc string is? Would you explain what it is? Okay, so Python has this thing, anytime you define a function or a class, um, or a method in a class, you can add just a bare string in there as a statement, and that automatically shows up in the documentation for that code. So they call it a documentation string or doc string. Exactly. When you run help on it, right? Yeah. Um. So when you're doing the, uh, the 
triple quoted strings, if it's multi-line code, um, the closing triple do double quote, however you say that, that closing thing right there should be on its own line. And then if you're doing just a one-liner, then uh, put it on the same line. And then finally, the last uh, portion of my presentation, um, with naming conventions, the overriding principle, I honestly struggle to even understand what this means, but he had it in there. So names that are visible to the user as, a pub as public parts of the API should follow conventions that reflect usage rather than implementation. Anybody kind of have an uh, explanation of what that means? So you might have a method that takes a, a Boolean parameter for whether it should like execute a certain loop. That's part of the implementation. So you would not name that parameter execute loop. You would name it according to the, the capability that's provided by that parameter, okay. like process order or something like that. So just in line with making your code a little bit easier to follow and read. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense then. Especially where a keyword, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a parameter can appear as a keyword. You want that to, to read logically if you say like process if order equals true or, you know, so that it just reads well. Right. Well, that makes sense. And one, one of the examples they use in there is, uh, you know, words like dict. When you're specifying a dictionary, if you just use that as your parameter, um, you know, that can get really confusing, especially if you're using dict elsewhere. And so if you can't come up with a more creative name for it, um, if it's a reserved keyword, he says just put a underscore after the word. So it would be dict underscore if you really have no imagination. Otherwise, you could probably think of like a better name for your dictionary. I would hope. Um, and then, as always, with pet bait, internal consistency is emphasized over uh, universal uniformity. So, uh, Modules and functions should have short, all lowercase names. So I know coming in, I would use the uh, lowercase first and then the uppercase second um, form, which it's not camel case, it's the other one. That's, that's camel so. case. That is camel case. Mm -hmm. So well, that's the one I was used to, but um, they, uh, this, this is really highly favored where everything's lowercase and if you need to kind of make it more readable, use underscores um, like in the examples up there. And then all of your class names should use the cap words convention where it's, every word is capitalized. So that is the end of it. Maybe, uh, you know, some other time we can um, do a presentation like a sub, sub one just on all of the language recommendations he makes because they're really rather fascinating but I thought I'd cap it at this. So. Any questions? Yeah, I can understand the, the why, what the logic behind going back, back to 79 characters is. I so, mean, frankly, I mean, we used to be limited by the 73 characters in <laughs> on the IBM mainframes, <laughs> and working with open systems and moving to Windows and moving to everything else just gave you the freedom to go as wide as you needed to without having to worry about punctuation. He uh, said that first they want kind of a one. Um, size fits all solution and not all editors or IDEs allow for more than 80 characters. Mm -hmm. So he said to that and then also because in a lot of cases, for example in Notepad++ you're always, you can split together screen and you're comparing you know, two mm -hmm. sets of code at the same time. He said just as a general rule it makes it more readable and it also makes it easier to, to perform those kind of operations. So he said he does have a, a, you know, a caveat in there that if your organization you know, kind of universally agrees on it, then you can go up to 100 characters or, or whatever you set. But this is for all the, you know, if you're doing anything for the Python library, it has to be capped at 79. So just to add to that side by side, that uh, if you're ever doing a diff operation, that it's really tedious if you've got to scan off the screen to the right. Because uh, then you've doubled that, you know, 80 character limit to 160. And you're comparing those as you go down. Does everybody know what I'm talking about here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So, that, that's another thought. Well, I'm still not convinced. Like, I'll have to see it for myself because I, I love the freedom of being able to go to a thousand characters if I need to on a single line. And it does get taxing because you know you can have a single if statement that's 120 characters. You know what I mean? So you have to do some creative stuff. So the, the, the problem with a thousand characters on a single line is then you're expressing more than one idea, and it makes it very difficult for somebody that's trying to read your code to digest it. Understood. And code is re re read way more than it's r than it's written. written. Also, uh, like a side by side comparison is really big on something like GitHub, where you're where you're providing feedback on somebody else's code. Um, right. I mean, it's rare to do the thousand line thing, a thousand character thing, but you know, sometimes you want to instantiate a, a fixed variable with a paragraph. Yeah.
That's an example I do. I want to see what you use this for. <laughs> any other uh, any other questions? All right. Well, let's uh, let's give McKay a round of applause. Thanks for your time. <laughs>